The first reading today is from the Old Testament book of Proverbs, uh, chapter 9, beginning at verse 1. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn her seven pillars. She has slaughtered her animals. She has mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her servant girls. She calls from the highest places in the town, You that are simple, turn in here. To those without sense, she says, Come, eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. Lay aside immaturity and live, and walk in the way of insight. We turn to our psalm readings from the 34th Psalm, uh, beginning at verse 9, and we will read these verses responsively. Fear the Lord, you saints of the Lord, for those who fear the Lord lack nothing. Come, children, and listen to me. I will teach you reverence for the Lord. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from lying words. We turn now to the New Testament, Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 5, beginning at verse 15. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time, because the days are evil. So do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts, giving thanks to God the Father at all times and for, in, and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here ends the second reading. Would you please stand? The Gospel according to John chapter 6 beginning at the 51st verse. Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate and they died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise Congregation may be seated, and we're very pleased for our special music today, the Nibby Trio. <laughs> This is my song, O God of all the nations, a song of peace for lands afar and mine. This is my home, the country where my heart is. Here are my hopes. My dreams, my holy shrine. But other hearts in other lands are beating with hopes and dreams as true and high as mine. My country. 
country skies are bluer than the ocean, and sunlight beams on clover leaf and pine. But other lands have sunlight, pine, and clover, and skies are Mine. This is my song, O God of all the nations, a song of peace for their land and for mine. Thank you, that was awesome. My friends, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Oddly enough, I resonate with the Jews' reaction to Jesus and today's gospel reading. Jesus said, Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in me. That sounds like cannibalism, and that's weird. <laughs> now, it would at least sound like that if we were to read this text at face value. We as Christians would read this text and likely connect flesh and blood to communion, where we eat bread and we drink wine. Jesus' words probably makes more sense to us because when we take the bread and the wine, which is a symbol of Jesus' body and blood, we can learn about the promise that Jesus gave to us that in his death and res resurrection, we indeed have new life. But at this point in the story, there was no Last Supper, and in John's Gospel, there won't be a Last Supper. So there's really no way for the Jews to know what in the world Jesus is talking about. I don't want anyone to comprehend what Jesus was trying to say here. They were confused and they were lost. Now as I've reflected on my internship experience, this sense of the Jews' confusion and lack of understanding resonates with how I felt the day I left for Brainerd. I'll confess to you, of the internship sites I originally looked at, Trinity was my last choice. <laughs> Which is really, really funny coming, looking at where I've come. And it was mostly due, it was a smaller population, I kind of wanted to go out of states, I, I just wasn't sure what I would get from this area. But I was also nervous because I'd be living on my own for the first time in the real world. There was no safety bubble at college. It was hard to say goodbye to friends and family. A year really felt like such a long time. And with some fears and tears, I left for Brainerd. If we take a deeper look into this gospel reading, we move past a misguided idea that, the, that Jesus wanted the Jews to literally eat and drink his body and blood. If we listen to Jesus' words with communion in mind, then maybe we can wonder about what does it mean to partake in communion, to taste and see the eternal life that Jesus is offering. I also had to avoid looking at things from a surface level when I started internship. When I arrived at Trinity Lutheran Church, I was overwhelmingly welcomed, and my surface level fears evaporated quickly as I began to dive into the rich depths of this church. Everyone was so friendly to me despite me being a stranger. 
I was first introduced to the staff, who are wonderful, by the way. I learned so much from them. I learned about the different ways they help the church keep going on its day-to-day basis. In case you didn't know, church exists more than just Sunday mornings. (laughs) But just as important as that academic side of things, I experienced a staff who cared about each other, and they would talk to each other about work or life. They'd joke around with each other. It was something I wasn't expecting. And so Joe and Linda and Alicia, Becky and Matt, I'll get to these two later, don't worry. (laughs) I want to thank you. I want to thank you so much for supporting me for the conversations we had and for guiding me when I had questions. Thank you to the staff for really helping me on those early days and even to the last day. I was also introduced to the Vision Council who work very hard to make sure the church's finances and the maintenance and congregational life of the church are healthy. They were also teaching me a lot about the structure of the church and how each each of them can contribute to the church's well-being and as if it wasn't obvious I learned that pastors can't run a church by themselves I had also met my internship committee which comprised of Chuck Bartles and Julie Anderson and Linda Harris and Doug Johnson each of them listened to me and supported me throughout the year They helped me to develop my pastoral skills by offering feedback, but more so what I appreciated from the four of them was that they were always available to talk with when I needed anything. I doubt other interns had a chance to talk with their head intern committee person like I did because Doug Johnson is always around. I'm sure I don't need to tell you how amazing he is. And the conversations I had with him on a daily basis truly helped me make it through the good times and the bad. I had found myself with these these first introductions, I found myself sinking into the rich soil of Trinity's story. And it became clear that this church was a special place. Things were well organized and the leadership was strong and committed it, it would be a good place to learn how to be a pastor. And academically, I knew this would be a good learning environment. But what really made a difference early on, what was, in a way, living bread for myself, was the welcoming hearts of all of you as I began my internship journey. I had found the rich depth of Trinity's story But then the next step was to root myself into the community. I made connections with many of you on Sunday mornings that I cherish. I was also introduced to the Friday morning men's Bible study, where we gathered and we would wrestle with scripture each week. We would share stories. We questioned the complexities of scripture. And we simply enjoyed being in the presence of one another. And as a young man, it really made a difference to me to have so many mentors that I could see every week as I wrestled with different challenges in my own life. I also had an opportunity to visit the Trinity Quilters as they gathered every couple times a month. And I got to learn about the ministry that they do, the different quilts they got to send all around the world. But it was more than just that. It was a group that supported each other, that they listened to each other's stories, they celebrated joys, and were with each other when there was sorrow. They also made some really tasty baked goods. (laughs) Yeah, really, really good. I personally don't quilt. And age-wise, I didn't fit the typical member of this men's group. And yet, despite me being an outsider, They invited me in anyways. If you ever wonder if inviting someone to join you in something makes a difference, it does. At least it sure did for me. These two ministries are examples of what I think captures the core of what Trinity's ministries are all about. To welcome all with an open heart. 
to support one another and to bring the life-changing gospel to our community. These were the ministries and the many others that I encountered that I got to plant my roots into, such rich soil, and each of these ministries helped me to grow in different ways. And so I continued to dig deeper and deeper into my internship experience. I also found another layer that you should all be so proud of. This church has incredible youth. I spent time with the different age groups throughout the year in Sunday school and confirmation and splash, summer stretch, the national youth gathering and some of the other retreats building up to it vacation Bible school, and so many more events. I'm going to treasure those memories I made with you youth this year. It was a blast. I'm going to remember the confirmation scavenger hunt where I ran away from all the middle schoolers because they had to figure out my middle name on their scavenger list. That was a lot of fun to do. (laughs) I'm going to remember the questions and conversations we had about God and about life in general and how we should respond to the many issues in our world. I'll remember giving you your Bible buddies and talking about how God loves you so much, and of course playing games with our beloved friend Chatter the Chipmunk as well. I'll remember playing night games at Cardia Deo for so long, we may have accidentally missed evening worship. I'll remember dancing on the floor at NRG Stadium in Houston. And I'm going to definitely remember that time in Galveston when we we were at dinner and we had two lawn tables and our whole group sat at them, but there weren't any more chairs. So I decided I'll just sit by myself and just kind of be alone. But then one of the students looked at me, I think it was Zach Sunderland, he said, Hey, Matt, come sit with us. Me? This adult leader you don't really know super well? And you're inviting me anyways to sit with you for a meal and to see like four youth make room for me? That was powerful for me. That was an act of love. I'll remember working alongside each of you on service projects. And I'll remember the many fun events we had throughout the year. Some of you have come up to me and asked me to stay and to not go. And... It really does mean a lot to me that you want me here. I'm, I'm sorry that I have to go. But youth, I want you to know you are amazing. You are gifted. You are loved. And don't let anyone say to you that you are too young to change the world. I may have felt scared at first, But when I dug deeper and deeper and planted myself in Trinity's culture, I have grown. I went from the first Sunday when I went up to chant the Kyrie and I told you all, yeah, I don't know how to chant, I'm just going to read it. I went from that to joyfully chanting it whenever I could. I went from being kind of nervous around a group of strangers to relaxed around a group of friends. You've let me preach to you, give communion to you, visit you in the hospital and in your homes. You let me laugh with you. You let me grieve with you. And you let me explore new possibilities, one which I'm really excited is living on past my time, the Brewing Theology Group. I want to thank you, congregation, for your love and support. Lastly, I have to thank these two. Pastor Hans and Pastor Dave for helping me this year. Both of them had open doors when I asked them at least a million questions a day. They were very patient with me. They taught me when I needed it. I am a better person and a more equipped pastor because of them. Hans, you taught me how to be more relaxed. (laughs) Shocking, I know. You taught me to be flexible, and your willingness to be yourself has helped me come out of my own shell. Thank you and blessings as you continue your pastoral ministry. And Dave, 
You were an awesome supervisor this year. You gave me such wisdom and insight in the areas of ministry I had no experience with. You were patient with me when I was wrestling and struggling with how I fit into my call. You encouraged me, and you helped me find my grounding as a future minister. Thank you, and enjoy retirement. You've earned it. <laughs> Each of these experiences has shown me a different glimpse of what it means to be a pastor. In many ways, all of you have been Jesus' living bread for me, teaching me and welcoming me, and I want to be that same kind of bread for others. So even though we go our separate ways, I will remember the living bread that Jesus claims to be. We are one in Christ. And at this table where we eat bread and we drink wine, this table is a proclamation of that truth that we belong to Christ. And even when we are physically separate, spiritually we are stuck together forever. When I leave Trinity, I will go back home with tears. But not tears out of fear, but tears because this is a place that's hard to leave. Because I love you so much, and I know that you love me. Thank you, and God bless. Amen.